Thank you, Bart. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you for turning up. It's uh, after last night, uh, it, I'm impressed to see the numbers here. Um, personally, I achieved a personal best after being to eight uh, River Prize uh, functions over the last uh, 15 years or so around the world. Um, I was in bed by one o'clock. That's a PB, as we call it, and I'm very happy to be here. Now, I am um, going to take you on a journey down the catchment, um, uh, hopefully uh, showcasing to you some examples of best practice in terms of sustainable catchment management. Um, I also want to um, uh, show you some of the so-called killer facts that I've compiled from a range of um, documents and journals as a result of the flooding earlier last year in the UK. Um, I was keen to get together some of the evidence, the actual measured evidence from projects where we've delivered sustainable uh, solutions. Um, I, I was keen to have measured evidence rather than modelled or predicted, evi predicted evidence because that is more convincing to the landowner, to the partner, to the engineer. Um, and also, being typically British, I confined my killer facts to UK examples. So um, that made it closer to home for people and hopefully um, it also showcased sites that they could go and visit. Now, if you want to... Um, if you want to receive the, this information from me, I, I managed to compile um, several pages of punchy facts measured from projects. Um, if you want to receive those, please uh, speak to me afterwards and I will add you to an e uh, a growing email group that I'm sending updates to. But it's actually quite difficult to find this information in journals and documents. And, and so uh, uh, a lot of people have told me it's very useful to have it all in one place where you have a simple reference that you can follow up if you want to. Uh, but you also have the punchy fact. And these slides I'm going to show you of actual examples um, contain some of those uh, bits of information. So I'm, I'm wanting to, uh, to demonstrate that um, these interventions uh, and the benefits they provide uh, confirm that looking at the whole catchment is critical when it comes to the health of rivers, when it comes to river restoration. And actually sometimes we do need to turn our back to the river and look, look away, look to the hills for some of the solutions. Um, and I will, as I say, take you on a journey uh, now from source to sea, which shows you some of these examples. These are all projects that I've been to and seen and photographed in the last few years within the UK. So they're all, they're all current and we're still learning from them, but already evidence is appearing which um, provides us with useful information. So if we start in the uplands, Many of our upland bog areas in the UK have been severely degraded, initially by acid rain and then by overgrazing um, and by drainage. And as you'll see in the top left-hand corner, you can see the difference in height between the original peat and the eroded peat as a result of these kinds of pressures. So we now have um, significant um, projects underway using, uh, involving a range of partners, <coughs> including the Environment Agency and including indeed the Flood Risk Management Department of the Environment Agency, who are realising that by slowing the flow in these uplands through restoration of these peat bogs, uh, we can actually make a difference uh, to our ability to manage flood risk further downriver. And on the right-hand side of the, the screen, you will see uh, a before and after of the same gully one year apart. Um, so this is an eroded gully, eroded through overgrazing um, and, and, as I say, historic degradation of the peat, drying out of the peat. And refilling of those gullies with heather bales and other natural materials um, has led to the restoration of this sphagnum bog. And measuring of the hydrograph uh, uh, downstream of this site has showed that this kind of work in small subcatchments can reduce peak flows by 30% and also significantly increase the time of that peak flow a kilometre downstream uh, by 20 minutes. Now, 20 minutes may not seem a lot, but if it's in a severe flood event and a community has a certain amount of time to evacuate, uh, that is enough to make a difference. So we are starting to produce uh, this kind of important information on, on reduction of peak flows and slowing of the flow, but also, conversely, uh, from another project in Wales in the Berwyn and South Clwyd Mountains, 
um, we have been able to measure that during drought periods, the flows become much more stable. Uh, the sphagnum is acting as a sponge, and flows during the drought are up to three times higher than they were prior to the blocking of these ditches. So there are flood and drought benefits from this kind of upland restoration. We now have uh, several projects in small upper catchments which are working with farmers to slow the flow as well. So we're down now below the, the, the real upland areas, down into the upper parts of small river valleys where there is quite a significant amount of grazing land and indeed arable land as in these examples here. And here we're working with farmers to create what we call leaky ponds, um, which are small structures attenuating surface flow and also taking diverted flow off the stream into small bunded areas, sometimes uh, constructed, as you can see with these examples, by, in wood, which is not particularly attractive in a landscape term, sometimes constructed with simply reprofiling the surface of, of the fields. And again, we are able to demonstrate that these, these small structures, if you do many of them, uh, and in this particular case, they've established that if, if, if you do five or ten in that small catchment, it makes little difference to the peak flow. If you do 15, that's when you start to take the top off the hydrograph, and gradually, uh, the more you do, the more impact you have. And in, these, in the Belford Burn catchment in Northumberland, they uh, implemented several of these structures, along with woody debris, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And they are absolutely convinced that that is the reason that the village at the bottom of this catchment did not flood during the heavy rainfall last, last season. And indeed, the farmers who uh, cooperated with this kind of activity sacrificed a small amount of their land for, that, for this purpose, and they're treated as heroes in the local pub because they saved their village from flooding when every other, every other village in that area was underwater. Other examples here at the bottom show an on-stream pond on a very small watercourse. Obviously, bunding watercourses is not ideal from a biodiversity point of view, but in very small streams and ditches, holding back of the water and trapping sediment coming off arable land, which is the purpose of these ponds, uh, is also extremely valuable. And they found that in this particular example, it reduced the sediment load in a flood storage area downstream, which is important to, you know, important to retain the capacity of flood storage areas, it reduced the sediment load into those flood storage areas uh, by 57%. It reduced the total phosphorus further downstream by 45% and the nitrate by 27%. So there are significant impacts on water quality and sediment. And the way this operates is that the farmers periodically um, retrieve the sediment from these on-stream ponds and redistribute it back to the land. Because in effect, it's their investment, it's their topsoil that, that is actually being washed downstream. And I'll come back to that later. So, so these solutions are benefiting uh, flood risk management and water quality. Turning now to woodlands. Woodland planting um, is, is, is something that we've been struggling with for some time in, in and alongside watercourses. Uh, when I first started 30 odd years ago, uh, it was a complete no-no to be planting trees in the floodplain. It was perceived as causing problems for flood management. Uh, and, and planting trees alongside rivers was, was a, a very difficult uh, objective to achieve from a conservation point of view. However, now there is growing evidence that actually doing so benefits flood management, if you do it in the right places. Of course, I'm not talking about doing it everywhere. Um, it needs to be in the right kind of places. But I'm also not just talking about in the river corridor. I'm talking about across slopes. And the planting of woodland shelter belts and the Pont Bren project in Wales demonstrated through water measurements that the infiltration rates within these shelter belts, that's the image on the right-hand side of the screen, infiltration of, of rainfall into the ground was 60 times higher in the shelter belts than it was five meters out into the grazing grassland alongside it. So it, the, the importance of, of woodland and hedgerows, uh, copses, etc., in infiltration is, is very significant. We also know that, for example, woodland contributes less than 
of the fine sediments to our rivers in Dorset, where it's been measured, less than 5% of the fine sediments, whereas pasture land contributes 25% of the sediment that ends up in rivers, and arable, 65%. And also, very importantly, because uh, we are seeing the effects of climate warming in the UK, of course, uh, the shading provided by uh, woodland planting in the new forest was measured uh, as re and reduced water temperatures by up to 5.5 degrees C on hot summer days um, compared to open grass and sections. And that was the crucial difference between watercourses in the new forest being suitable for brown trout uh, or not. So again, uh, multiple benefits, uh, benefits in terms of slowing the flow, and I should just point out the photograph on the left shows woodland planting in an already wooded section, but in an area where we're introducing woody debris anyway, um, and helping to create uh, attenuation of flood flows in that woodland area. And here are examples of the, the woody debris on the top left from that same, same project. An installation of these structures on that project um, uh, more than doubled the travel time for the peak of the flood, one kilometre downstream. We also know that woody debris um, has led, uh, where it's been measured, has led to marked increase in invertebrate scores and in dissolved oxygen compared with reaches alongside which don't contain woody debris. So there are water quality benefits and biodiver obvious biodiversity benefits. The example on the bottom left shows a, a situation further down the catchment in a floodplain area where woody, woody debris has been installed to deflect flows, in effect, sideways onto the floodplain. So it's been used as a kind of barrier, but normal flows pass under the debris and through it, um, and higher flows are deflected sideways on the one bank into a wet woodland area of some nature conservation importance, and on the, the right bank out into floodplain grassland. And the bottom right-hand corner shows you that same area, which has a bund constructed across it, which is still grazed, so the farmer is not losing grazing land. Um, and the farmer himself operates a simple handheld sluice in a small aperture within that bund to help the water drain away in a controlled fashion. And just as I mentioned in the Belford Burn catchment, this particular catchment in Somerset, when we had all of that intense rain and major flooding elsewhere, this catchment and the, vill the village at the bottom of this catchment did not flood. And I, there is a great video online where the farmer himself says he was a skeptic about this project and now he firmly believes that what they've done there prevented the village from flooding. If we move on down the catchment into larger floodplain areas, the Environment Agency is heavily involved with key NGOs such as the Wildlife Trust and the RSPB, National Trust, etc., in, in uh, restoring and creating large wetlands. We have biodiversity, we have government biodiversity targets, and the Environment Agency is a very important player in delivering those targets. And one of those targets is to create 200,000 hectares of new biodiversity habitat, priority habitat by 2020 and the 10 year period to 2020. That's a very challenging target. In the agency, uh, we are heavily engaged in that. And we've set ourselves our own contribution targets to that. Um, and we are funding a lot of these projects uh, through flood risk management. But also increasingly so, and this is an area where we need to get better, I believe, um, we are starting to realise that actually delivering these sustainable wetlands can contribute significantly to the objectives of the Water Framework Directive. And so gradually we're seeing more uh, Water Framework Directive related funding coming into these projects. And together with the flood risk management pot, that constitutes quite a significant amount of money and enables us to do fairly large scale land acquisition, uh, usually uh, then uh, leased and managed by wildlife organisations. And so uh, more and more of these wetlands are being constructed uh, around the country. It's very difficult to identify the precise benefits of uh, these wetlands in terms of ecosystem services because they're often in very large areas, large floodplain areas. There are many other, many other uh, activities which impact on on sediment, on water quality, on carbon storage, etc. But we have got various snippets of information that you can glean from journals, which give you an indication of the kind of contribution these, these uh, sites can make uh, to more than just biodiversity or flood management. 
and one of them is here, organic carbon in uncompacted sediments in permanent ponds is 10% compared with 3% in agricultural land. So there is a certain amount of carbon storage, car carbon sequestration benefit from these kind of uh, projects. I guess like many countries, we also have many, many areas that are designated for flood storage, for flood attenuation. And often these areas are very artificial. A lot of them look like the, the site on the left there. That is a flood storage area on the edge of a town. Um, but, but they could be so much more than that. You know, they, they, these are barren deserts for biodiversity. They provide very little in the way of quality of life uh, for people. And they provide very little other than flood storage. But they could be so much more. That site on the right is a flood storage area in, in East London. That's a site that was already fairly diverse, but we spent, as part of a, uh, an enlargement project to the, to the scheme to give it greater capacity, um, we spent uh, quite a bit of effort on improving it in, uh, from a biodiversity perspective, adding in many other habitats, but also um, adding uh, footpath access across a river which separated two districts of London, two boroughs of London. People were not able to get across into this park. Now there is access uh, for people across the river. And the flood storage area itself protects 400 homes. It prote protects the major flood, uh, Ford, uh, Ford Dagenham factory, which is a huge uh, car factory in East London, and the Barking Power Station, which supplies a third of London's electricity. So it's a very significant flood storage area in terms of flood protection, but now it's so much more uh, and its value for biodiversity is, is huge. River restoration itself, uh, of course, has a, a part to play. Um, actually, I'm going to, although there are no doubt other benefits, I'm going to major on the health and well-being benefits of river restoration. Most of our, in the UK, our, our restoration crudely splits into two types. It's either restoration of protected areas, rivers in protected areas. Usually these are quite a long way from where people are and um, may be difficult to access for, for most people and not the sort of site that many will visit. And on the other hand, they are urban parks which contain rivers which have been neglected and people have turned their backs on them. And we've seen great examples uh, from around Europe at this conference. Here, are, here are, is uh, an example, one example, uh, from, um, from the Medlock in, in Manchester. And it shows you um, almost a moonscape in the top left-hand corner there, 100 years ago uh, uh, or so in Victorian times when um, this, this area was, was covered in mining activity. There was industrial pollution everywhere. Uh, there were cemeteries alongside the watercourse that were slumping into the river. And so the river was turned into a brick-lined channel. Eight million bricks lined this channel uh, from bank to bed and across the bed. Now the uh, riverbanks are stabilized with vegetation. It's a public park. And so um, we have... Uh, started to restore it section by section. And this photograph in the bottom right-hand corner is where we were at this year. The one above it is where we were at last year. And it shows you the tremendous difference you can make vi uh, visibly uh, to such a watercourse. And that in, on its own, that visible change, is something that's attractive to people. Um, but actually, it's much more than that. Already within the first few weeks of the restoration, they were starting to find invertebrates species, mayflies, etc., that were previously unrecorded in that section of river. Nature responds very quickly. That's the great thing about working with rivers and wetlands is, of course, we get this instant gratification if we get it right. And, um, and now we have a wonderful place for people to visit. And studies in London on similar restoration schemes have shown that, for example, at Ladywell Fields on the Ravensbourne, Visitor numbers increased by 250% as a result of the river restoration, a huge increase in numbers. And uh, surveys have shown that always, whenever we measure this, 80 to 90% plus of the people who visit these parks think that what has been done is a good thing. That's a, that's a huge vox pop. That's a great result in terms of public uh, perception 
and valuing of, of this kind of work. <coughs> and this is really important because um, physical inactivity is, is a major, major issue in modern society, certainly in the UK, but it's preventable. It's, and uh, it's currently affecting something like 60% of the population. It's costing us over a billion pounds a year to our National Health Service, and we need to do something about it. And every little impact that we can have is going to be worthwhile. And so restoring rivers through urban parks like the Quaggy in South London um, can make a tremendous difference to the local population in terms of their levels of activity. Studies on this particular scheme, which involved the daylighting of a river, so the river passed in a culvert underneath the park uh, and was then daylighted back through the park with walkways and wetlands, etc. That led to a dramatic increase in uh, the amount of time that people spent in the park, as you can see here, 44% uh, 40 40 increase in the amount of time every person spent. People walked further to get there, and they visited more frequently as a result of the restoration. Um, not only that, though, there's an economic benefit in this kind of work. There is consistent evidence that doing this kind of restoration in urban parks leads to an increase in property values in, in walking distance of these parks by 5 to 7%. That is a consistent figure that comes from urban park restoration in London. Now, 5 to 7% in walking distance, I've calculated, I've done a quick Google Earth search on how many properties, what those properties cost. It equates to something like £17 million worth of additional property value. So, so significant economic benefits, and that's why councils, developers, planners should all be supporting this kind of acti activity. Suds, um, we've already heard about, and actually... Surprisingly, I'm quite short of so-called killer fact information on suds. I would love to have more. Uh, the main one that I can find is that on average, urbanisation without suds trebles the rate of runoff uh, during storm events. But if there's anyone out there that's actually got measured evidence of individual suds impacts, uh, I'd love to get hold of it because we need to m multiply this up. We need to transfer it. Um, to other situations and use it as part of the selling pitch. And now I'm down at the bottom end of the catchment um, and uh, looking at coastal realignment. And this is something we have to cope with in the UK because our sea level is rising awfully fast. We have something like a one metre predicted increase in sea level rise on the east coast of England and indeed all around the coast. Uh, this example is actually from the southwest, from Somerset. This aerial photo was taken. Uh, a month or so ago, of the wonderful new Steert Managed Realignment Project. And these managed realignment projects, again, we're just starting to learn about the evidence uh, that, of ecosystem services that they can provide. But we know, for example, from the Altba project, that um, the scheme cost £10 million, but it delivered £12 million worth of storm protection benefits. This is on the Humber estuary, the Altba scheme. Um, but other ecosystem services benefits are estimated at about a million pounds per annum. And these can include things like, of course, carbon storage. Uh, they provide hugely important nursery areas for commercial fish species. Um, they enable traditional breed grazing for um, salt marsh, uh, lamb and beef, for example, very specialist uh, meat products um, from this kind of land. So it's still land that's farmed. It's not sacrificing it all to the sea. Um, it's allowing the sea in on a tidal cycle, but it's still grazed and farmed. Uh, and, of course, wonderful sites for wetland birds. Already these sites are proving to be a huge draw for bird watchers as well. Um, and bringing something into the local community, community in terms of uh, economic benefits for local be bed and breakfast, pubs, etc. So that's a quick rattle through some of the benefits and some of the evidence that goes with it. But I do just want to finish with um, one of the biggest problems of all. Uh, and this is my only bad example. I hope you'll agree the rest were supposed to be at least good examples. This is a bad example. Actually, this is taken from one of the estates which has done brilliant work. But they have one farmer, one tenant farmer out of half a dozen who has not been playing ball. And this is 
This is what I saw when I visited the Honeycutt site last year. A, a field growing turnips on a steep slope using heavy machinery with wa uh, water and soil pouring off that land uh, into the bottom corner of the field. Then spewing on down into the country lane, which then becomes, in effect, the river um, in, in, in high rainfall events. On it goes down into a neighbor's field, creating a ditch system of its own. Then it gathers in the bottom left-hand corner. Here, uh, it gathers in the bottom corner of that field, a meter deep, topsoil. That's money down the drain. That's, that's what that farmer invested in the top left there. It's on someone else's land further down the valley. And then on it goes down into an important wildlife site, wet woodland area, and then on down into the river. And that one individual, because he has not got to grips with sustainable farming and, and healthy soil management, um, is, is actually spoiling it for the rest. And so it's really important that we try to tackle the worst because we need to bring everybody up to a certain standard if we're going to not only improve the health of our land, but also, of course, the health of our rivers. And uh, where does it end up? Well, there it is. There's an aerial photo from uh, January this year uh, of the UK. And you can see the colour of the Severn Estuary here uh, with huge amounts of topsoil washed down the drain. Some, we estimate some £45 million pounds worth per annum literally washed down the drain. So, as I said right at the beginning, sometimes we need to turn our way uh, back to the river to, to, sort, to sort the solutions for the river. Um, and I would encourage you all to, to think more about that. But in conclusion, I think it's quite clear now, it's no, longer, it's no longer acceptable to claim we don't have the evidence that these uh, natural flood management, that these working with natural processes uh, solutions work. We do have the evidence. It's out there. We need to use it. We need to transfer it to our projects and we need to sell, sell, sell basically, because we need to win hearts and minds on this. It's a cultural thing in many cases, but we must use the best of this evidence to make that argument. And I'm not seeking perfection here, and I urge academics in the audience not to be shy about releasing their information when it's not quite perfect. We need to go with the 80% rule. Uh, we need to get on with it, and we need to go with the best available information. So I'll conclude there. I, I hope you uh, uh, would like to share your information with me, and I'd be very happy to share my data with you. Thank you.